Kirkman's Secret History of Comics. I'm super psyched to be here, so let's bring our panelists out on stage. Creator and executive producer, Robert Kirkman. <laughs> executive producer, David Alpert. <laughs> executive producer and showrunner, Rory Karpf. <laughs> and executive producer and showrunner, Daniel Youngie. Move around. Let's just move it around. Move it around. You guys swapping? We're swapping. Hey, are we going to stand up the entire time like your last panel? <laughs> Please, no. I can't do it. <laughs> Did that knock the wind out of you? Yeah, I'm, I'm real not. I'm not built for standing. <laughs> Were I given a choice, sitting would be my mode of choice. So you like sitting better than lying down? Yeah, lying down, you know, it's a lot of pressure. <laughs> a lot of pressure to what? To go I mean, to sleep? Just, just to stay flat. You got to stay flat and, and yeah. the things are, you know... Going to your head. What? Okay. I keep things from flowing to my head. <laughs> Wait, do you sleep below a bookcase? I, I have a bigger head than most people, so. Oh, okay. You know, I got to make sure that things are flowing down away from it or it just gets bigger. Do you strap pillows to your head with duct tape when you sleep? Only when I sleep upside down on my head. Right. Very good. All right. Well, this is a good start to the panel. <laughs> uh, so, Robert Kirkman's Secret History of Comics. We don't know what this is yet. It hasn't premiered. Is that picture going to be up the whole panel? <laughs> <laughs> How would you describe that face you're making? That's, a, that's an are they photographing me face. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, obviously this is a documentary series that uh, every episode, I've seen a few episodes, and every episode takes on a different part of hist the history of comic books, right? Yeah, we're li really pulling back the curtain to tell the stories that, uh, hold on, what, what's, what, did you notice something? I... Well, you know, I, there's someone right behind me. I, I thought the Image Comics section was the best by far. <laughs> Todd McFarlane. Gentlemen, th hey, thanks to these good people for legitimizing an industry that people look down at for a long, long time. So they're bringing it in there. So thank you, gentlemen. And I'm, I'm glad we're just a part of it and, and you're there. So good luck. <laughs> thanks, man. Good luck. Thank you. Thank you. The check's Todd in the McFarlane, mail, Todd. Thank everyone. you so much. He's underneath every table during every panel. Now, now everyone say hello to Rob Liefeld. Rob Liefeld's up here. <laughs> here they are. And so is Stan. Jim Shooter. Yeah. <laughs> um, Jim Shooter's not here. <laughs> he wouldn't fit under this but, table. Uh, no, but no, I mean, uh, this show is kind of based on, uh, you know, conversations that me and my other creator buddies have at cons, uh, talking about, like, you know, the, the people that benefited us in our careers without them knowing it by, you know, blazing trails and taking risks and the different things that happened to creators in the past that, you know, aren't really that prevalent, that people aren't quite that aware of. It's really just pulling the curtain back so that people see what goes into making a comic, uh, the kind of people that, you know, dedicate their lives to making comics, and how it is that the stories that everybody loves these days that are, you know, filling the multiplexes and, uh, you know, TV and all that stuff, uh, uh, you know, where it all comes from and, and, and what it is that goes on behind the scenes. Well, actually, um, I think that's, that's sort of the core of this here, is that really, um, if you look at the film business, the television business, the video game business, so much of it is being driven by comics and that the stories behind the people who made the comics that you know are known to sort of Robert and his friends and that he'll tell me and I'm like oh my god why does nobody know that that was sort of the core behind trying to get this show made so you guys are all big comic fans that's safe to say right oh you can, uh, <laughs> oh yeah you you seem to not be i th i think it's it's too late to get me fired, so I can't. No, 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 you don't. Now. No, 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 you don't that, that hire. Is, that is not true. That is not true. Super talented <laughs> documentary directors based on how they feel about comic books. You hire them based on how well they are at making documentaries, and that's why this episode is going to be kick ass. And I would have to say, after you guys work on these episodes, you gotta, you, you're pretty interested. You I love am. comics a little bit. Yeah. So no, I like absolutely. comics a lot, so. <laughs> I'm just going to throw that out there. Can you guys talk about uh, your first experiences with comics? I mean, everyone kind of remembers the very first comic they bought. Uh, Robert, what was it for you? Uh, first comic book I bought ever was Amazing Spider-Man 344. It had an amazing cover of uh, uh, Spider-Man is fighting the rhino, and Cardiac is there, and they're all fighting, and there's got like all kinds of captions and stuff, and the rhino's like, hold on, Cardiac, I want to kill him. You know, and there's, it's it just, you know, it's zany to look back at it now because there's just tons of words all over the cover, which is not something that you see in a lot of comic book covers. Uh, but uh, I don't know. It's just, uh, uh, you know, 
being able to sit down and read that book for the first time, like I still, I know exactly what room I was in in my house. I know, you know, what it looked like. I know, you know, what age I was and where I was. Like, it, it, just looking at that takes me back to that moment. So it is kind did of... Did you a, buy it yourself or did someone buy it for you? No, that's the first comic I bought myself. There were other comics that I was, was given at like younger ages, but that one's special to me because that's the first time I actually like walked into a store and was like, oh, this interests me, you know, as opposed to, yeah. Is right, that what I you like said to, to the guess. clerk? Oh, this interests me. That's how I spoke as a child. Child, Scott. <laughs> you seem like a real weirdo. <laughs> when, when will dinner be prepared, mother? <laughs> it, I will be potty ink now. <laughs> Do you remember your first? Yeah, the uh, Chris Claremont X Men was sort of my gateway drug, and uh, it took me to my first comic convention at the basement of the, the local Marriott, and uh, that's sort of where I got introduced to the world of independent comics. And Elementals was a thing that was like kind of a big deal, and so the first comic that I actually bought was Elementals number one, and it was like introduction to like the idea of mature comics, mature themes, like the art was different than anything I'd seen before. Um, and then I also, it was sort of my first introduction to like speculation because as the, even over the course of the weekend at this one show, the, the price of the comic started actually increasing. So you would see retailers raising it from, it's like, I don't know, it was a big deal, it was like $4. to by the end of the show, they were selling it for like $10. And I was like, you know, I felt like I discovered, oh my God, there's not just great story and great interesting things here, but there's actually a business here. And that was the thing that really, uh, I was like, oh, this is cool. I can buy comics, I can sell comics, and I can read great stories while doing it. How about you? What was your... Rory, what you got? <laughs> hit us with it. All right, I'm going to hit you. Uh, you know, shockingly, in middle school, uh, I didn't get a lot of girls, believe it or not. <laughs> and uh, Daniel was an athlete growing up. I, was I, I don't not. buy it, Rory. Well, I had a couple girlfriends. I had, like, Mary Jane Watson, Gwen Stacy. Mm -hmm. uh, those were my girls. And I saw this guy who was also a dork, Peter Parker. And I'm like, wait a second. He's got superpowers, and I tried to jump off my sofa, and I realized I didn't. But um, I love Spider-Man. I kind of fell in love with the comics of the 1960s. They were, like, reprinting them at the time when I was growing up, so fantastic. And, like, Marvel War. tales and stuff yes, like that. Yes, exactly, and just Jack Kirby's artwork and Stan Lee, and it was like this whole world was opened up to me, and uh, I felt, like, accepted, and after reading comics and going through some psychotherapy, I was able to come out the other side, and it was awesome. And how, how's your love life now? Um, Daniel, we're, we're lovers. Love. <laughs> we're actually lovers. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Anytime he walks by a poster, <laughs> that's on. A, that's for another panel. Um, <laughs> You're doing a panel on your love life? <laughs> yeah, that's uh, right, right. immediately after that, this. That's, that's, uh, that's, that's our next you know, show. It's the secret history of Rory's love life. And then, and then, Daniel, I have to know what is what's the first comic book you 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 fell in love with? So my, my my brother was a Marvel fan, and Spider Man looms large. So. Penguin, Green Goblin. It's it's vicari I, I sort of enjoyed it vicariously through him. But I will say, when I first got the call for this job, and I thought they got the wrong guy because I'm not a comic book guy. Then I heard the stories, and the stories that we're doing in this series are the things that any documentary filmmaker like, like us, you know, salivates over because these are the these are unknown character-driven stories. There's a lot of there's drama. There's there's people losing it all. It, this, it's, these, are, these are incredible films regardless of the, the content, the comic content in front of it. Yeah, and what's really cool too with Robert and David and also AMC and the, the executives there is they wanted each film to be totally different. So it's, it's kind of this anthology series and there's different takes and we tried to take some risks, you know, in making the films and telling the stories in a way they haven't been told before. So we hope you guys really like it. Well, the, the big thing that we actually got, and this is, this is sort of the... Um, it's rare to actually get this as a mandate from a network where they basically said, listen, um, you know, it's much cheaper to say, hey, like just make one format and just sort of like rinse and repeat and do the same thing again and again. And they go, no, no, we really want each of these things to be its own little movie, right? And we're like, that's really ambitious. I mean, you know, trying to do that on TV is very, very difficult. And they said, you know, well, you can do recreations, you can do interviews, you can do animations, you can do photographs, you can do stills. Like, it was a really, they said the whole thing was out there. So really trying to find people that could actually make films as opposed to uh, trying to figure out, like, how do we sort of turn this into a factory? That was really great. And but Rory those people did. weren't available, so they asked Rory. And I <laughs> well, I noticed you, you got some really great old footage of... Uh, the creators of Superman <laughs> in court, and it was color footage too. Yeah, we, we we filmed some recreations on there, and you know, uh, you know, we're uh, we're excited about that film. You know, it tells the story of Jerry Siegel and Joe Schuster, and you know, I I didn't really I I kind of knew that 
they went through their life and a little bit destitute, but we, we really hopefully got to tell a, a story in a different kind of visual medium than it's been told before. And I don't I think it's, I, I, I have to say like, uh, I'm a hardcore comics fan. I mean, and, and watching these films after you guys were finished, I mean, there were definitely multiple parts in all the films where I'm like, Oh wow! I didn't know that. Oh oh, I I, I forgot about that. Or oh, I, I, I never I never knew it went that far. Like it's it's cool. there's a lot of stuff you guys dug out that I think is really cool. So even the hardest of hardcore comic book fan, there will be things in these episodes where you're like, I never knew that happened. That's insane. Yeah, I mean, I just watched uh, I, I watched the image one, the one that talks about how uh, the image is seven or uh, yeah. they all left Marvel Comics. Uh, and started Image, and I, I knew the story relatively well, but there were details in that that I had no idea about, and um, s- stories about them fighting. Oh, yeah. There's a lot of drama in all of these stories, right? Yeah, and when, when available, um, you know, when they're when they're still alive, because we do deal with uh, a lot of stories that involve creators that have already passed. But uh, you know, we go straight to the source, and so we're getting stories, you know, straight from the horse's mouth about like how they felt and and what they were thinking and and what went into what they did, and it's 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 pretty impressive. Stuff. We interviewed Jim Shooter. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, we did. Wow. yeah, we did. So. For which episode? That's in the Mighty Misfits who made Marvel, which really it tells it kind of tells like the the beginning years of Marvel and how it all came together and you know you hear a lot about Stan Lee and he, he's he is so iconic but we really got to shine a light on Jack Kirby too and hopefully give him his show. Yeah Jack Kirby. Yeah. I like there was there was a part in that one where uh, they were talking about how no one would give Jack Kirby work yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and and Stan Lee basically just liked him because he used to be his PA. Yeah his errand boy. His errand boy. I like that guy. I used to get him sandwiches. I'll let him draw a book. And then Marvel Comics happened. Yeah. It's insane. So, so much great detail. Uh, you have a lot of great interviews in the series as well. We saw some people up there. Uh, you know, you have uh, Kevin Smith. Yep. Obviously sat down for a long time, it seems like. Um, and Michelle Rodriguez. He actually, he stands in places and talks about comics 24-7. <laughs> and so any documentary crew can just come with a camera <laughs> and just get whatever he's talking about. <laughs> it's, it's pretty great. And then uh, Famke Jansen, I believe. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Michelle Rodriguez. We how how deep is Famke's knowledge of comics? It's deep. Yeah. Really? Uh, it is. Really is. Well, you know, great. It, she's, she's prominent in a film we have called City of Heroes. And, uh, it, you know, again, credit to AMC for taking a risk because uh, we look at the importance of New York City in comics, especially after 9-11. And, you know, uh, she, she lives in New York. She went to college in New York, and uh, she had a lot of thoughts on, you know, being there when 9-11 happened. And, you know, we got to interview J.K. Simmons. And, you know, it's a, it's, it, the film's kind of a love letter to New York, but also we, we have some different people, like different actors, uh, directors, Jonathan Nolan's in that film. Um, and uh, it kind of, you know, it could... It's kind of a touchy area, and I don't think I've ever seen it explored before, kind of the impact that uh, in a post-9-11 world and how kind of comics, they really stepped up and were like the artistic platform uh, after that, that tragedy. Well, I remember right after it happened, uh, The Amazing Spider-Man, right. they postponed what they were doing, and they put out a special 9-11 episode where the heroes sort of like... Mm. helped people after the tragedy. Well, yeah, the heroes were the firefighters and policemen. And he right. kind of, you know, bowed down to them. And we looked at, you know, uh, how movies changed after that. And, uh, you know, we, we got to, we, there's a whole segment of the film on the Dark Knight film and, and the influence of New York and that. So, um, you know, it's, uh, it's pretty cool. That's great. So can you talk about what uh, each of the episodes are? Do you want to spoil that yet? Or do you... Uh, can you yeah, talk about I mean, well, the subject matter? Yeah, well, we talked about the Mighty Misfits of Marvel in the trailer, and, and you know about the image episode because of the trailer and the trials of uh, uh, Superman. But if you guys want to run through the other three episodes that we haven't sure, sure. talked about. Um, uh, I'm doing a film called Color of Comics, which is about Milestone, Milestone Media, Milestone Comics. A lot of people in this room might know. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Might know about this African-American venture from the 90s um, that was part of the DC, that was, uh, was published by DC. Um, it really it existed for three years, but what it what it endeavored to do was incredible. You know the fact that it had African American an African American universe, African American heroes, written by African Americans, African American artists, um, and through through looking at Milestone, we actually look at the expanse of race in comics throughout throughout the the whole history of the genre, which is 
really fascinating where we are now with Black Panther coming out and we've really come full. Well, there's a lot to say about, yeah, definitely. There's a lot to say about that because there was a period of time where if you had an African-American character in a comic, they had to have black in the title. Right. And now there, now there is a whole bunch of movies coming out where they are rightly trying to make the characters a little more like, a little more representative of the world around us. And you have some some pushback from that. Does it deal with stuff like that? And well, yeah, and, and actually now, um, I think some people in this room that know that Milestone is getting relaunched, which is sort of the yep. end of the film, because now the time has come for this, this thing that was really started in the 90s. Now, finally, we've come full circle. That's and ready for Milestone. And behind this is the story of really two kids who grew up together in Queens, reading comics, making comics, and the trials and tribulations of their friendship over the years. It's, it's a powerful episode. Amazing. Uh, what about the other two? Well, we have a, a film on New York, and like we talked oh, right. about the post-9-11 world. It's called City of Heroes. And, you know, what I, I think all of our films have, all six, is they're, they're all pretty emotional, you know, because people put their hearts and souls into comic books. You know, I'm sure you do yeah. uh, and all your work and how passionate you are. And it's just really cool to be able to shine a light on the creators but also the fans you know like we do have these celebrities that we interviewed in the series and they're so genuine about their love of comics and how it affected them and I knew how much it affected me growing up and um you want to tell them about the Wonder Woman movie yeah we're doing an obscure character named Wonder Woman <laughs> um and uh now that this that story is so prominent now a lot of people know this but um she was created by a psychologist um who was obsessed with truth he had um kind of a non-traditional relationship with his wife and another woman who were um, collaborators on the making, making the original Wonder Woman. And I think the fact that the film is so incredibly successful now that harkens back to all the things that William Gaines was doing back in the, in the 40s um, really makes that film timely right now. And just interviewed Patty Jenkins, what? We interviewed two days ago. We, I think our last, hopefully, our last <laughs> interview for the film was Patty uh, Hold Jenkins. on, guys, I've got another one. <laughs> <laughs> so... Um, that, that was great. It really ties the movie into to everything we're doing. That's amazing. Um, so, w- first of all, when does the show premiere? When does the show premiere? It's, it's premiering in November, actually. November. Uh, we're still uh, fi- figuring out the date, but it'll, uh, the first episode will come on. Uh, uh, hold on. Can I talk about this? I've been anyway, told to ask you that. So. Yeah, I, I just want to point out that I looked back and uh, saw no one. So uh, <laughs> I, act, I acted like I got a thumbs up. There, I did there's not. three people um, sitting cross-legged <laughs> backstage, and they kind of went like this. Don't reveal the inner workings. Uh, no, no, no. It, 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 we're going to have an episode that will premiere on uh, Sunday uh, uh, with The Walking Dead, and then uh, that following Monday the show will continue, and it will be on Mondays on AMC uh, in November. All right. Very good. Yeah. Okay. What was that? Thank you very Thank much. Thank you for, uh, for, for contributing. <laughs> Does anyone else like the show? Yeah. I guess the only guy who likes the show, I guess. <laughs> um, so, Robert, you're a huge influence in comics right now, but you grew up as a fan. Yeah. Um, who were some of your influences growing up? Well, I mean, one of the episodes that speaks the most to me is the one about Image Comics, because... Because it's uh, about you at the end. <laughs> <laughs> mostly, uh, mostly, um, no, but not, not, not because of that. But uh, no, I mean, uh, as, a, as a child, you know, I was 13 years old when Image Comics was formed, and so uh, it was a very impressionable age, and so I was reading comics at a time when all of the talk was about being independent and owning your own ideas and not letting, not, not creating characters for a corporation that's not going to give you a fair shake, and, and that was something that was really ingrained in me, you know, uh, uh, work for yourself, don't work for others. And, uh, and it really kind of, uh, you know, Does that have to do anything with, uh, about your parents at all? Did they instill that? Yeah, I mean, my you? father was also a small business owner. And so what between my do? father being a small business owner, he was a, a sheet metal fabricator and a welder. So uh, my, my dad did that would, too. They would, did he really? Are you making that yeah, up? Yeah, I'm not. Really? He owned a machine shop where he did sheet huh. metal and stuff for no, like We used to drive by factories and my dad would look at ductwork on a, on a roof and go, that's mine. <laughs> right. And be like, really? Wow, you went all the way up there? Uh, but, uh, but yeah, it was really cool. And so between him and, and, and then all of my comic book reading, you know, being focused on new ideas and, and, and you know, blazing your own trail and uh, uh, setting your own path, it, it really kind of put me in a place where when I started in comics, 
uh, you know, I started my own publishing company and I did my own ideas and, and I ended up doing books at Image Comics and, uh, you know, and the company that they ended up building is the reason I'm here today. Um, if I had done Walking Dead at any other publishing company, uh, you know, I wouldn't have been able to partner with Mr. David Alpert here, and I wouldn't have been able to form Skybound, and I wouldn't have been able to be as involved in the Walking Dead television show as I am, and I like to think that the Walking Dead show wouldn't be as good as it is because I wouldn't be as involved, but, you know, that's debatable. Uh, uh, and, and all of that is because Image Comics founded a company that allows creators to own their own creations, uh, and, and being able to you know, be a part of all of that and, and have a say in what happens with, with your stuff is all because of those guys. And so that episode really meant a lot to me, and I think it's a great story that you guys should all check out. I mean, they all are, but... Uh, There's a really yeah. funny story you tell in that. I don't know if you want to tell stories you tell in the episode. I, I want to watch you tell a story that I tell in an episode. <laughs> I don't know if I could do it as good as you, sir. Could you do it in um, a Kirkman voice? You, what's that? Could you do it in Kirkman voice? Kirk, well, I don't know. <laughs> do it in the voice of, when you were on my show, I'll do it in, in that voice. Sure, Robert sure. was on my television show when he was losing his voice. Yes. And all he could do was whisper. It was, it was pretty weird. <laughs> um, but uh, you tell a story about when you pitched The Walking Dead. Yeah. Um, and how they didn't think that it was a very good idea as it was, right? Yeah, they, uh, uh, Jim Valentino was the publisher at the time, and uh, so I pitched them The Walking Dead, and, and, and he was like, well, you know, there's never been a, a zombie book that's ever been successful. You know, the comic book audience doesn't, doesn't really like zombies. So in order for Image to take this zombie book on, you know, you need to come up with some kind of a hook. And uh, I'm very good at not taking no for an answer. Uh, and I, I highly recommend that if you're a creative person trying to, you know, get your foot in the door. Uh, uh, I highly recommend lying, which is what I did. So in the moment, I was like, uh, look, uh, you know, uh, it's, uh, it's really an alien invasion story. And, uh, uh, you, know, they, uh, you know, the aliens are, you know, they're creating the zombies to weaken our infrastructure so they can take over the world. And so eventually, you know, it'll be, uh, you know, it'll be aliens and stuff. And they were like, well, that's interesting. I've... <laughs> Never heard of that before. That, that sounds really great. Now, I didn't know it at the time, but that is apparently the plot from Plan 9 from Outer Space. <laughs> uh, news to me. Uh, and they didn't know either, and so they, were, they approved the book. And then Eric Stevenson, who's the publisher now, was the marketing director at the time, and he was in the meeting when, when, when I pitched it. And uh, the first issue came out, and he you know, had read it, and was like, oh, man, people really responded to this book. You know, it's really good. People, people really like it. And... Uh, uh, he goes. Uh, he goes. But you know, I, I, when I read it, I, I didn't see any kind of hints to the alien invasion plot. Uh, you know, were they, were they too subtle, or, or are they coming in later, or you know, what's the deal there? And I said, uh, I lied to you guys. Uh, and he's like, What do you mean? And I was like, uh, yeah, yeah. There's no aliens. I just wanted you guys to pick up the book, and so I lied to you. And uh, he goes, You know, book's probably better for it. <laughs> So, and then so you, no aliens. And then you turned around and used the aliens in Outcast. I did. I did. No. No, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> I did do a thing where uh, I used to, in the letters column, uh, I would get letters in where they would be like, I really like The Walking Dead. This is true. It's kind of funny thinking back now, but like issue six, issue eight, issue 13, I would get letters where people would say, I really love this book, but I just don't know how you're going to be able to keep this going. It just doesn't seem like an idea that has any legs. Like, I don't know how you're going to be able to keep telling stories in this world and keep them interesting. Uh, and so I would always respond, well, I'm probably not going to be able to. So by issue 75, there'll be like aliens in the book because I will have run out of ideas. <laughs> and so then when I got to issue 75, there's a great 12-page uh, story that I did with uh, Invincible artist Ryan Otley, where I introduce uh, aliens into the Walking Dead and people it was a gag that was like after the letters column and I've never reprinted it so you have to like go to a comic shop and actually find in uh, Walking Dead 75 uh, where uh, the issue ends if you'll remember with uh, Michonne hitting Rick over the head with a rock because she's turned against him because he's crazy and like beating people up because he does that like every 15 or so issues <laughs> and, uh, uh, Rick! and so so he gets hit in the head with a rock and then you read the letters column and then he wakes up and he's in a spaceship and there's aliens everywhere and he's fighting aliens and I got letters then that were like, you've ruined the book. Why did you put aliens in the book? But it was all just a gag. I love that. Um, guys, I want to open this up to all of you. Obviously, you've spent a lot of time with the history of comics at this point. Uh, comic book movies are the biggest movies in the world right now. Mm. And it, it's hard to believe in a way with people like us who grew up with comics because... 
you know, we were made fun of for liking comics. Uh, you know, we would come to things like this, uh, Comic-Con, and people would say, you know, you know, just why are you wasting your time doing this? And now they're the biggest movies in the world. Why do you think that is? You know, I think there's a, there's a general sort of sense of acceptance of comics. Like when I was, when I was a kid uh, and I wanted to read comics, you know, my, my dad actively would, would uh, like punish me if I read comics because he, he thought they were like juvenile, they'd like rot my brain, like he thought they were like really, really bad. And so, you know, my mom would always like sneak me into, she would drive, I lived, grew up in New York, she'd drive me into Forbidden Planet and let me go get some comics. But like, at that time, it was still sort of seen as that nerd thing, but I, I remember when Rob Liefeld got that, uh, he got that like uh, Levi's 501 jeans commercial, and there was like all those comics. Is your fly buttoned? <laughs> but like you had all this, all of a sudden it started sort of hitting pop culture in a big way, and then you had all those big comics coming out, and they had like, I, I don't know, X-Men number one must have sold, I don't know, it was like five or six million copies of the book, and all of a sudden everybody was talking about it, it was in the news, and people were like, oh yeah, I like that too, and I like that too. And it actually came out, and I remember this moment because I felt like this personal moment was like a cultural moment. At that moment, when it was like it was on the front page of the New York Times, my dad's like, "You know what? I grew up reading comics, also." And I was like, "What? You, like what? You you like comic books? And you, like you've been preventing me for like years reading comic books?" And it was in that moment I was like, "Yeah, he had sort of internalized that stigma, right? Because he had been an athlete, and athletes weren't supposed to read comics or some bullshit like that." And I looked at that and. I was like, well, don't do that to me. And I saw, I saw that, though, replicated with my friends and their families where all of a sudden it was just okay. Everyone liked it. Like, they were just good. So everyone's like, well, why don't we want to do something good? Like, let's just let's enjoy comics. Definitely. I mean, we, we explore this a little bit in the Mighty Misfits who made Marvel. Like, you know, Stan Lee, Jack Kirby, these guys were feeling like misfits a little bit themselves. And I think, you know, people want to believe in heroes, and especially in the Marvel Universe, the heroes are imperfect because people are imperfect. And, you know, I think, you know, we want to believe going to the movies that, you know, we can have these flaws and everything and still kind of do the right thing. And, I, you know, I know I took my, my little boy, he's 11, to see Spider-Man Homecoming, and, I mean, he loved it. And I think part of the reason why is he could try to live a little vicariously through that character, which is really cool. And by the way, I'm still pulling for the aliens storyline. I don't know. I, those are my letters I've been sending in, so just, just heads up. I mean, I, what's also covered in your, in your Marvel film is the fact that these are our modern-day fables. These are archetypes. That's why they're so timeless. And, and yet we think about these things as being like springing from the head of Zeus, but they all came from individuals. And that's why this series is really interesting, is going back and figuring out who these individuals are. I mean, even, even the story about The Walking Dead, it's so much of a part of the fabric of our society now, it's hard to imagine you sitting in a room and spinning this story and needing to pitch someone on The Walking Dead. Uh, so in, in many ways, that's what makes this series so exciting because we get to go back and figure out who these people are and what made them tick and where these things that we consider fait accompli is where they originated from. Did I mean, you find out anything? Did, you, did, you, did anything ever come to you like, oh, I've never thought of that before? I mean, I think, like, going back to Jack Kirby, you know, I mean, he created true art, you know, and really influenced so many people. And then you hear about some of the things he went through feeling unappreciated. And I think we really explored how... Um, he and Stan came together, and then how they broke apart and kind of came together again. And I hadn't seen that before, uh, you know, at least in the depth that we've told it. And same with the creators of Superman. I mean, these guys sold Superman for $130. And, you know, when the Superman movie was coming out with Christopher Reeve, one of them was working as a postal worker, a postal clerk, and the, the other one was on disability living with his brother in a one-bedroom apartment sleeping on a cot. So I, I didn't know that stuff. I mean, that's just good human story and drama, and, uh, you know, it was, to me, a privilege to be able to tell. I mean, I think one of the things that's interesting and um, gets overlooked sometimes is if you want to put on a play, you need a lot of people, you need some resources, you need a playhouse. If you want to put on a movie or TV show, like, you need a lot of money, you need a lot of people. But it's like, other than, let's say, you know, music, because all you really need is maybe a guitar and some form of recorder, like, if you, if you have an idea, you know, a kid in a basement with, his, with, a, with a buddy of his could sit down and draw a book that could sort of launch an entire, you know, global franchise. And it's rare that you have a medium that's that powerful that you can say, hey, one person, 
without sort of formal education in this specific skill, just by being a fan can go out and do it. I think it's really empowering. All right. Well, Robert, you're, you're a comic book expert. Not really, but go ahead. Maybe a little. <laughs> Who wins in a fight, Wolverine or the Hulk? Well, that depends. Uh, you know, um, you would think that the Hulk would have him dead to rights. He is uh, far more powerful. Uh, far more agile. I think that, uh, you know, he can cover a lot of distance. He can leap very far, you know. Oh, Green Jeans, he's bouncing around like a monkey out there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, and, but Wolverine, you know, depending on if, you've, if he doesn't have the adamantium skeleton, which sometimes he doesn't, well, then, you know, he's screwed. But, uh, uh, you know, Wolverine, he's, he's very resourceful. He's uh, nearly indestructible. I think, that, uh, I, think that, I think, you know, in the end of the day, I, I think I'm going Wolverine. Hulk smash. Hulk smash. Hulk smash. Right here. Rory. Argument. Oh, Wolverine versus Hulk. I don't know. I mean, I saw Logan. He went down pretty easy at the end, so I'm going to go with the Hulk. (laughs) He he got impaled on like a tree or something, right? That's old Wolverine, though. Well, you didn't You We're not talking about old Wolverine versus old Hulk. Well, which Hulk are we looking at? Like Bill Bixby? Ask yourself, uh, is is Hulk stronger than a tree? (laughs) 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 Who Who wins Invincible? Versus all of, the, all of the Walking Dead zombies. Oh, Invincible, for sure. I mean, Walking Dead zombies can't even bite through his skin. Really? Yeah, Invincible's Invincible. But can, can the... Can... It's, it's in the title. Sure. Invincible is more invincible than uh, zombies' teeth are. But Invincible has orifices. Uh-huh. Where, now where's... you're interested. <laughs> yeah, tell me, tell me more. <laughs> But couldn't like a zombie like French kiss Invincible and then it's game over? I think Invincible is strong enough to prevent a zombie from French kissing him is a sentence I never thought I would say in my life. <laughs> Robert, you, I mean, you... Scott Ackerman, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> <laughs> Robert, you famously, you're at Image now, you're a, you're a partner. Uh, you've said you're never going to go back to Marvel. Never going to go back until never I'm gonna... destitute. Do you have, I mean, as a storyteller, yeah. you've loved these characters. You, have you ever thought there was a story you could tell that would tempt you to come back and do Spider-Man, to come back and do the X-Men? No, I mean, I, I, I do have an affinity for, you know, a lot of Marvel characters, a lot of DC characters. I think that it's, you know, there's cool stuff to be done there. But, uh, you know, while I will sometimes pick up a Spider-Man book and read it uh, or, or pick up a, a DC comic, I, I just don't have that desire to, uh, you know, spend the time and do the work to actually, like, tell a story for them. It's just not, there's not a passion there. My passion is creating new ideas and creating new stories. I, you know, I have this conversation with creators all the time. It's like, you know, do you want to work on Stanley's creations or do you want to be Stanley? Do you want to create your own things the same way that he did? And I think that that's, uh, that's the thing that appeals to me. Uh, Todd McFarlane, we did a panel in this very room a few minutes ago and he put it... He's under the table. He's still under the table. Oh, God, hey, watch out. Uh, but, uh, uh, yeah, he, I think he put it, he put it best. Uh, he said, uh, you know, working at Marvel's like high school for me. I, I don't, you know, I look fondly uh, uh, back on my days in high school, but uh, I would never want to go back. You know, it's not the thing that, uh, that I'd want to do. So, yeah, it makes sense that way. Are you going to be like the Stan Lee of all the books you create and be in the movies? Like, are you going to pop up in the Invincible movie and be like, hi, Invincible? Uh, no, I'm not. And actually, people ask me about Walking Dead cameos all the time because they're like, why aren't you a zombie in Walking Dead? And, and I always say, you know, it's hot in Georgia, which is true, and it's kind of a pain in the ass to get in the makeup, which is true. And then the big thing, this is the big thing. I got a bit of a pumpkin head. I don't know if you guys can tell on the monitor. I think, do I have the biggest head on stage? I think that is definitely the biggest head on stage. By far. Um, so it's actually bad to put zombie makeup on my face because once you put makeup on a head, it just makes it bigger. So a lot of the people that are zombies in The Walking Dead are small people because then we can build them up and they look like not small people. If you take a big person and turn them into a zombie, they look like giants walking around. And it's weird. But one of the other reasons that I never do it, uh, which I don't often talk about, but, you know, t- I just did a panel with Todd, so he's on the mind, uh, on the mind is uh, Todd has a horrible camera cameo in his Spawn movie, <laughs> uh, where like Spawn and the Violator, not the new one that's come out, the old one from the 90, 98 or so, uh, Spawn and the Violator getting ready to fight in an alley, and the camera like pans over, and Todd McFarlane is in the alley going, oh my god, they're going to fight, oh my god, here they go, oh my, and it like lingers in my memory, it seems like five minutes, and, in my, and as a child, I was like, 
fuck that guy. I am never doing that. That is terrible. And so, uh, no, I will, I will next, never do a cameo. In the next season of Walking Dead, I think it would be really funny to stick in a scene of you going, they're going to fight. Oh, yeah. look at that. They're here come the go. zombies. They're coming to get me. They're over there, and they're over there. Oh, my God. So, yeah, no cameos for me. <laughs> I wasn't happy about being in this, but, you know. Hey. <laughs> All right, well, I think some people probably have questions out there. Who's got right questions? About that? Who's got questions? Oh, don't just, fight over just the before, microphone. No, the, the, that wasn't even a fight. They were really nice Just a yeah. quick thing before we take our first question. I just want to say that uh, uh, the team at Skybound that worked on this is yes. not just Robert and I, and th- this couldn't have been done. But it's mostly me. It's mainly Robert and his big giant head, um, but I just want to thank. Uh, if it doesn't, it's not as good when other people say it. <laughs> That's kind of a dick move. Wow, this has got real. <laughs> I think you should apologize. <laughs> I'm sorry. Go ahead, no, please. <laughs> I just wanted to thank Catherine Winder, yes. Rachel Skidmore, and Sean and Brian first for. All right. Yeah. Yep. All right. Yes, sir. Hi. Um, I was just wondering. You talk about uh, Siegel and Schuster and Superman and that their whole situation, but do you touch on uh, Bill Finger and his contributions that went toward actually making Batman next season good? Season two. Season two. Oh, yeah. Okay. There's so many stories like this, right? Uh, yeah, unfortunately, there are. Did you have a big list of stories that you culled from and... and We did. We did. And I I think Bill Finger does make an appearance in the City of Heroes briefly uh, for his contributions. Uh, Yeah, there's so many stories to try to tell. Um, So we tried to pick six that we were all passionate about and thought had mass appeal, but hopefully we can do more seasons to come. It turns out comic book makers are reclusive and (laughs) hard to... (laughs) Hard to contact. Mm-hmm. So, did you try to get Steve Ditko? Um, we have not. Tr- well, but kind of tried. You mm-hmm. know, he's hard to locate. Uh, we've he's alive in New York. I got that going. I'm quite the uh, Sherlock Holmes detective. And uh, oh, we've tried. We tried to get uh, Frank Miller, who was here yesterday. I saw, and I, I tried to approach him and got tackled by security. Um, but yeah, the you know we're we're. I'm fans of these guys and love to have them participate in the series. And what I think hopefully after season one airs and people get to see it and see what we're about and that we're trying to do this with some, you know, true passion and craft that we, we can get uh, some of the, the harder to get. That's right. People. I would love to see a whole episode about Steve Ditko and him basically just quitting the entire business. Well, he's in the, the Marvel uh, episode. He's in the Marvel one. He, yeah, there, there's definitely some mentions, and we ask uh, Stan about, about what happened there, so you have to tune in. Right. Okay, great. Um, right over here. Yeah, I guess kind of piggyback off that last question, I was just kind of wondering if, uh, you know, so you guys do have plans to kind of go beyond these six episodes and um, tell That's stories down the That's up to you road. at this point, but we'll do our so best. So is this kind of like a trial balloon? You want to just kind of throw it out there and see if, you know, people respond to this I content? Mean, six and episodes is not really a trial balloon. It's a lot of no, work, right? Definitely not. <laughs> yeah. But you should get all your friends to watch the show and get them to tune in because, you know, we'd love to do more yep. of these. Absolutely. Please. There Thank we you. go. There we go. Yeah. Right. Hey, who is this now? My, quest- my question is for Robert. Coral. Hey, how are you? <laughs> At what point in life did you realize that this is what you wanted to do? Fairly young. I mean, I, I was probably, uh, it was like maybe the year before Image Comics. I, I think I was about 11 or 12. And, uh, uh you know, I was looking at a Marvel comic, and I saw the credits box in the, in the comic, and maybe I was a dumb kid, but I saw the credits box, and I was reading those names, and I was like, there's like people that make these, huh? <laughs> and, then, and then I realized, well, well they, they, like, it's like they, like wake up, they like wake up in the morning, and they make comic books. It's like their job, and, and they probably get paid, and they like uh, buy groceries with that money and stuff, but it's comic books that they make that helps them buy the groceries. Uh, and uh, I was like, my dad buys groceries with uh, we, uh, welding metal together. And he's always a, taking a, us to go look at ducks on the yeah. tops of buildings. <laughs> Duct work. What, but, what, uh, what? Yeah. And so I was like, well, I don't want to be I don't want to be a metal worker. I want to be a comic book person. That seems cool to me. But what age? I mean, obviously you wanted to do it when you were young. But what, what age were you when you thought, oh, I can actually do this? 34. No, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> you know what I mean? I mean, it's like great to have a 
sort of fantasy about, oh, it'd be so yeah. nice to work in comics, but what led you to actually going, oh, wow, this could be a career for me? Yeah, I, I mean, I don't know. Uh, uh, I started my own publishing company when I was uh, 19, and I did a comic book called Battle Pope. Anybody a big fan of Battle Pope? You're all lying. Where were you in the year 2000? Uh, but, uh, uh, no, I, I saw a guy. It was good. Uh, but, uh, uh, you know, it, it's just one of those things where you don't realize you can do it until you're doing it. Like, I, I started my own publishing company and, you know, got some buddies from high school to help put things together. And, and, and we were just making comics. And then, you know, I wasn't making money at it. So I don't know that I would ever say, oh, this is, I was doing great, you know. But, uh uh, you know, we were producing work and, and people were seeing that work and it's, it is a weird, it's weird how easy, you know, to talk about what David was talking about. Uh, it's so strange that comics are a medium where you can just get a couple guys together and the next thing you know, you're doing it. It's, it's really kind of magical because of that. Yeah. Do you want to do comics when you, uh, or now even? <laughs> no. <laughs> cool. All right. a, just next me. question. It's a, it's a tough business. You'd be better off being a welder. Yeah. Honestly, good, good chat, good chat. <laughs> sorry, my, <clears throat> sorry, my voice is kind of gone from the other day. Oh, sorry. No but, problem. Um, yeah, I've done welding before for years as an ironworker. It sucks. Yeah. My question is, are you going to dive into like uh, pre-code horror comics or like seduct- yeah, seduction of the innocent or anything like that or comics code? That's yeah, we, now, we actually you, planned on doing an episode about the seduction of the innocent and uh, uh, Frederick Wortham, is that his Wortham and uh, his attack on EC Comics and the formation of the Comics Code and things like that. But uh, 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 you know, that's such a well-known story in comics that uh, uh, you know we might do it a little bit later. We thought these episodes would be a better focus for 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 this. I, this, I can this always six. remember the day that Marvel didn't put the Comics Code on one of their. I think it was X Force, the uh, I think Peter Milligan X Force, Spider-Man drug issue. Yeah, there was a Spider-Man in the But the the one that sort of changed it for everyone when they didn't put it on and no one cared, and they were like, wait a minute, why are we paying the comics code? Yeah. It was incredible. F the comics code. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, hey, Rory, come on. I'm sorry. All right. right. Apologize. You got me riled up. Great people. (laughs) Someone stole the Bob Kane on Bill Finger question, so. Oh, no, it's great. I saw Bob Kane walk in the halls at San Diego Comic-Con. I came when I was 13 years old. He was just uh, wandering around, and I got a picture, so... I mean, it's, uh, it really is for me like a dream come true because I was that little kid that just loved comics and was in all of it. So, you know, thanks. Are you going to write comics yourself or draw? Um, maybe in the distant future. We'll, mm-hmm. we'll see. I don't know. All right. Cool. I had a comic, you know, in middle school, and I'm, I'm hoping it'll break big pretty soon. I know some people, <laughs> at, Sky- I know some people at Skybound. Okay. Hook you up. Thanks. Thank you very much. I've got, I've got uh, an Yes, next question. I think it's really cool that your guys, they're doing like a defiant, uh, HBO's defiant, but for comics, because, you know, back in our day, comics weren't really a thing. It's nice to see all of a sudden, you know, it's acceptable. It's one of those things where if you look at him and goes, ah, he's got a comic. He's like, what's wrong with that guy? Nowadays, like, hey, let me borrow your comic. That's a, such a great thing. Um, I think also I'd like to thank, thank Robert. He kind of made the two things that kind of made people look weird. Uh, back in the day, cool, which was zombies. Somebody said, oh, you like zombies? Kind of a weirdo. And comics, once again, you're weird, especially being from the inner city. Those two things were very hard to come by. You know what I'm saying? If I was in my hood with a comic, they'd be like, hey, dude, what you doing with that? You know, it's like, what you? I would like. Think about all I've done for people with giant heads, too. <laughs> and beards. <laughs> and beards. He, he revolutionized beards, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Gillette, hook them up. <laughs> but um, Robert, what I want to ask you was, since you're, you know, I know you don't like to be put in there, but you're like the new Mount Rushmore of comics for the for our generation, I guess. You could argue you're, against that, but sure, sure. You, but you, I think you understand what I mean. Like, there's yeah. Stan Lee. I know I'm great. Carry on. <laughs> <laughs> Does that hold any pressure for you? Like, uh, it's like, uh, if I do this, you know, what are they going to look at me like 10, 15 years from now? It's like, mm, what, what kind of legacy would yeah, you Yeah, when want? you put out something new, do you get afraid that it's not going to be the next Walking Dead? I don't think about that because... Um, the stories I write are the stories that I'm interested in that, that bring me enjoyment. So when I sit down to write, it's something that I'm excited about, something that uh, I really want to do, and I don't really consider how the audience is going to react to it. You never or, think about, like, oh, this is going to be so cool when people read this. 
Well, I mean, every now and then I'll be like real excited about like some certain thing, and I'll be like, oh, I wonder what people are gonna think when they get to this point and they realize this is what I'm doing. So there's a little bit of that, but you, you get if, pretty excited about Negan dialogue, though. Will you? Every now and then I'll call somebody about some Negan dialogue I came up with, and I'll be like, oh, Negan's gonna say this, and they'll be like, don't do that, that's crazy, and I'm like, I'm still doing it. Ah, he's gonna talk about feet, uh, and then, uh, uh, but but I mean, um, because if I think if I took any consideration into how many people read Walking Dead comics or, you know, what the reactions could be. I'd just be crippled under the pressure of it. But what I do think about is, you know, I am in a position where I do have a voice uh, that people hear and, and, and I, I can uh, shine spotlights wherever I can. And that's something that uh, I take very seriously. And so, you know, that's something that we try to do at Skybound, uh, uh, you know, bringing new voices out like Daniel Warren Johnson and, uh, you know, giving them a great spotlight on books like Extremity. Uh, and then, and then with something like this, like I have a relationship with AMC. If I can talk AMC into giving an hour of screen time to a medium that I love, uh, you know, then that's fantastic, and that's a great thing to do with, you know, the abilities that I've gotten from all the support that you guys give us over Walking Dead. So, and if like you happen to get to do, paid, I'm talking. I'm talking. No, I'm kidding. I'm done. Go ahead. <laughs> you told me to interrupt you as much as possible. I, I, I begged you to. Uh, <laughs> My joke is not going to land now. All right, let's go to the next one. <laughs> Damn it. Hi. Um, knowing how small the comics community is, did you guys run into any resistance? Was there anybody that didn't want to appear on the show for fear of pissing off the wrong people or the wrong company? I would never name names Jeff Loeb. <laughs> <laughs> He's shifty. Are, is there still some bad blood between people that you guys were able to put on the screen? Uh, I <laughs> uh, Daniel, why don't you answer that? He's got a big, a really important answer. You can't, you cannot do a film on Image Comics without encountering a little bit of hubris, which is really the the, the story of Image Comics. Um, but the fact is, the the I think the camaraderie, the, although everyone knows that there's internal tensions there, it's really a story of what they did and now the camaraderie 25 years later. But certainly, yeah, there's. But the good news is it's all better now. Yeah, and, and as a no filmmaker, tension. if it was all, if it was just a rosy road, it wouldn't be terribly interesting. So it's the grit that makes it the most interesting. Mm -hmm. Oh, great, thank you. All right, yes, sir. Hello, all. Hello. Uh, the trailer <laughs> looks absolutely amazing. And I wanted to know if you guys are going to be releasing it anywhere online for all of us to share. I believe it is being released online, yes. Okay, great. Because uh, the reason I ask is I'm in the trailer and I can't oh, yeah. brag about it unless I got something to back it up. Oh, this is Eddie. He <laughs> is this Todd McFarlane? <laughs> so, no. <laughs> he is in the trailer and he also scanned the, a lot of the original comics for us oh. to use. Yeah, you guys and dipped into my collection for that episode. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, wow. we did. Thanks to you. And... Uh, so, awesome. I'm going to look for it online, and I'm going to post it everywhere. Please do. Can you all please do that? Thank you very for much. For me, please. Yes, just right. for Eddie. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Thanks. All right. Yes, uh, the Punisher here. Hello, Robert Kirkman. I'm very excited for your, the new show for uh, The Secret History of Comics. Thank and you. my question for you is, when first pitching The Walking Dead to Image Comics, did you have the story mapped out in your head from the get-go? Or did it all come together like little by little like, issue? Uh, I mean, I had a very long runway planned. So I knew, you know, that they would live in the woods here. I knew they'd go to Herschel's farm. I knew that they would eventually get to the prison. And I had some inkling of Woodbury and the governor, but I hadn't actually like pinpointed this guy's called the governor and, you know, he's got a daughter that's a zombie and all that kind of specific stuff. But I knew, you know, I'll do 12 issues about this and 12 issues about that and 12 issues about that. And uh, I feel like that runway has allowed me to, you know, feel comfortable writing the story and know that I'm always leading to something because when you set out to tell a long story, you need to know that, you know, there's going to be exciting things along the way and there's going to be an escalation to the story overall. And if you don't know where you're going, you can kind of meander like I am with this answer. Uh, and so, uh, uh, so yeah, I mean, I, I did know some, but I had no idea about Negan or Alexandria or any of that stuff. Uh, but that stuff, you know, came another like three or four years before I got to it. So I always know like three or four years ahead of, you know, where I'm going. So it came naturally. Oh, thank you for your yeah, you, do you, uh, Thank you. Do you have an end in mind? Oh, I do. I do is, have is there an, something that's been said in the media? I do have an end in mind. And I answered uh, uh, that question on Thursday at a panel and said, yeah, I know what the end is and I'm working toward it. Uh, and so then a bunch of articles ran clickbait 
like article or a bunch of websites ran clickbait articles about why wow, Robert Kirkman's ending the Walking Dead comic, uh, which is not what I said at all. Like uh, I know what the end is. I'm working toward it, but I'm working toward it very slowly over the next thousand years. So you know, uh, uh, so yeah, don't believe what you read on the internet. All right. Thank you. Yes, you sir. All right. Thank you. Uh, Unless you're reading on the internet that this show is amazing. In which case, that part is correct. So you're saying don't listen to the fake news media? Yes, don't listen to the fake news, only listen to you're my You're a big news. Trump guy, aren't you? <laughs> right. Yes. No. That's all right. Uh, it's actually probably more for the filmmakers. Um, I saw in the trailer uh, some of the archival footage of some of the 90s image stuff. Uh, as viewers, when we see the show in November... Uh, can we look forward to any kind of like really cool diamond in the rough old archival footage that people have never seen before? Because uh, I feel like in this world, like this history of comic books, like is did anybody have a camera on their shoulder? Like in the old Marvel Studios, DC, whatever. Uh, can we look forward to any cool archival stuff? So the answer is yes and no. Mm -hmm. um, considering how media saturated, I mean, look around all the cameras here at Comic-Con, it's such a media saturated genre, or medium. But back then, not so much. We did get some great things from openings like Golden Apple and LA got us some great footage. Um, thankfully, the image guys were self-documenting a little bit. We got a little bit of stuff from their basements, literally, um, that haven't been seen before. But surprising paucity of great footage. You know, I think everything we have is up on the screen. Nice. We did get some nice 1960s Stan Lee footage speaking at colleges. There was like a, it's at like the University of Wisconsin or something. In a, like, literally in a vault, there was these unfound tapes of Stan Lee. So I don't think anyone has seen it before. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's so amazing. Stan Lee in bell bottoms, hippie beard. <laughs> yeah. I remember that. that Lover wow. Stan Lee. Yeah. So if you're a Stan Lee and bell bottoms fan, you'll be excited about this show. Okay, we have time for one more question. Yes, ma'am. Hello. Um, sorry. <laughs> I was just wondering um, how doing all this research on the history of comics has shaped your view of the future for comics. That's a good question. <laughs> I don't know. Well, I think the future of comics is bright. I mean, I, I really do. I mean, I think it's probably never been better, and probably thanks to you and what you've done at Image, you know, it's a very creator-driven industry. Well, I think a lot about how uh, the comics industry is a medium more so than film and television and other mediums that really embraces new ideas. I think that, uh, you know, when you have a book like Saga that can kind of come out of nowhere and hit as much as it has, that's somewhat unheard of outside of the comics medium. And that makes me really excited for the future because I think about comic book fans, I think about how I was inspired by the early image era and how new comic book fans that will eventually become, you know, the comic book writers and artists of the future are being inspired by all of the new ideas that are, that are really taking hold now and how that's going to bring about an influx of, of really great new cool stuff. And so uh, when I think about how, you know, Stan Lee and Jack Kirby went through the things that they did and how different creators like the, you know, Simon and Schuster, uh, you know, had their lives you know, pretty much decimated by the companies that they worked for, how there's so much more opportunity in comics because of that, and how that's going to lead to a lot more prosperity of comic book creators and a lot of prosperity in the kind of stories that we're able to tell. And so because of that, I think it, 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 you know, things are looking really good, so I'm really excited. I, 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 I want to sort of pick up on that. I think that 25 years in, sort of image comics is really the future in terms of... Uh, building a platform to empower creative and diverse voices. I think it's rare for you to see a publisher that publishes so many different types of stories, right? Everything from, if you look at something like Bitch Planet to Sex Criminals to The Walking Dead, there's not really anybody else out there doing it, and that's an amazing thing, and I think we're gonna see more of that to come, but I think Image is the future. In, in comic books is an industry where there's a comic book called Bitch Planet, and no one in the audience went, huh? <laughs> They all went, yeah, Bitch Planet, we read it. It's yeah, great. It's great. It's a great yeah. book. All right, Not awesome question. Thank you so much. All right, well, make sure you watch the premiere of Robert Kirkman's Secret History of Comics in November. I want to thank our panel, David, Robert, Rory, Daniel. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Thank you, everyone.